Good morning. All right. So I tend to, I guess I've kind of forgot to say the message title. You always tell me that. You always ask me at the end what the title was. So I'm going to make sure I start with it today. And that's Happy Renew Year. Happy Renew Year. Um, originally, I was going to call this the cliche of a new year. I wasn't really settled on that, but I really was thinking about how New Year's is, is kind of a cliche. Uh, you know, cliche is a phrase or opinion that is overused and betrays a lack of original thought or a stereotype. Um, you know, I titled a message a couple of years ago called New Year, New You. And while I think that that rings true, and I think that was a good title for the message then, um, it's also a, a cliche saying, um, you know, new year, new you, it's a, somehow changing the calendar, like you were explaining to me the other day, uh, you know, going from the end of December to the beginning of January, somehow that br- could bring in a new you. Um, but I have a feeling that that whole idea of a new year and the resulting hope, anticipation or celebration, it's a big cliche. Um, uh, in and of itself as of late. Maybe it wasn't 100 years ago, but I feel as of late it, it is. Uh, but, you know, it's the end of the year. Uh, a lot of times you see top 10 lists of the past year, top 10 moments of 2018. You know, uh, all these sites give you the rewind of all your posts from the last year and, you know, how, what's got the most likes, you know, so somehow the best photos are the ones that, the best moments are the ones that other people like the most in your life. <laughs> somehow that gives them value. Uh, you know, we tend to see trends from last year, trends for the new year, um, nostalgia, hope, people really looking for the lifting of burdens in their life. Um, I remember we got a gym membership um, years ago, uh, and we went once, and then we didn't go, and we didn't go, and then apparently we owed a couple months worth, and we went to go cancel it. I said, just don't worry about it. So <laughs> apparently it's... We're not the only ones to have done that. I think they just canceled it out of pity. It's easier than trying to collect past due fees. But you got a free t-shirt out of it. But the culture keeps saying that the past year was a bad year of culture. You know, that 2018 was so bad. It was so awful. Um, I have to wonder why they think that. Is it just because they've been told that? Um, although there certainly are plenty of awful things that go on in the world. And we tend to see more and more of that every year, especially with our access to seeing what goes on around the world. We're more aware of it, at least. Um, But I don't know that next year is going to be better. It's probably going to be worse if you look at the whole world and history scale and timeline. I don't think it's going to get any better, no matter who they put in office, no matter who uh, wins the Super Bowl. I don't know that it's going to be a better year or not. But I pray and I hope that it's a better year for you and for me and for... Uh, people around the world personally. Uh, If it goes better with us personally, um, I think the first thing we need to do at the beginning of next year is really consider what is better for us personally. A lot of times we set these goals that aren't really the best goals. But being that it's not the new year today, we have 364 days down with one to go, and the last day of the year is on a Monday. So go figure. But Ecclesiastes 7, 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit than the proud in spirit. And 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And as we get into New Year's, we have a lot of traditions with our New Year. Uh, I read the other day that Las Vegas is now trying to match New York City in the cloud of its New Year's celebration. Personally, I wouldn't want to be in either place normally, uh, especially in the summer. It's hot in Vegas, I I imagine, Uh, but especially not on New Year's Eve night. Something maybe I used to want to do in high school or something, but not anymore. Too crowded, too busy, too stinky. But New Year's Eve, we think of the ball dropping, fireworks, reflections, uh, family gatherings maybe, or feastings. Uh, even in some cultures and sometimes in history, there's been present exchanges. I think uh, Christmas has kind of taken over that. Uh, but I remember partying like it's 1999 before being a believer. I remember partying in 1999 when the millennium came over. I remember parts of that party uh, pretty vividly. Uh, but I also remember New Year's Eve after becoming a believer. 
how it was much more peaceful, much more relaxing and restful. Even though we had church parties, we would stay up and watch the ball drop or uh, everyone would have a potluck or we'd play ping pong or games and things of that nature. Uh, we're having a worship night. I think those are some of the best nights. We're just staying up and worshiping through the new year, not even caring about the ball dropping. Now I'm just getting so old, I don't know that I'll be up for it, although I do stay up late. Although uh, sometimes I feel like I just want to go to bed and don't care about the ball dropping and miss it. Uh, or having game nights with friends. You know, these uh, having a new life in Christ gave me a different way to celebrate a new year, a night to just relax and enjoy and uh, just have some time and, and fun. But with that, with these celebrations, people are really looking for a brand new start. They want to ring in the new year and forget the last, the last year. They hope that the new year itself will bring prosperity, health, happiness, etc. Uh, a lot of people start diets in the new year. I remember doing a marketing push a couple times for work around the new year for diet foods. Uh, personal promises to stop doing things, you know, stop smoking, uh, stop doing whatever bad habit they have or start doing new things. Uh, and again, like I said, they really want to forget the past year. They want to forget what it was like and start new. And, and I don't blame them. A lot of times we have bad years, rough years, especially without the Lord. I'd want to forget the last year. But listen to what Isaiah 1, 18 through 20 says. It says, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And again, in Hebrews 8, 10 through 13, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me. See, I won't have a job. I won't be a pastor when God comes back. There will be no need for me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And that he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. See, God is ready to make us clean. God is ready to take the things that have stained us in this past year and make them new even today. He doesn't need to wait for the ball drop. He can do it right now. And he's also saying that he won't remember them anymore. And we want to forget the past year oftentimes or the past 10 years, but God is ready to forget our sin. Things that should never be forgotten, things that could never be forgotten before the cross, he is ready to forget them. But what happens every year? The same thing. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon says. The same sort of things happen every year, every year. You know, you, there may be a new iPhone, but it's the same sort of thing. In two years, it'll be obsolete, the battery will be slow, and you'll need a new one. But I read this quote the other day, and I thought it was uh, pertinent. It kind of stuck with me. It says, a Christian is not somebody who has said, I need to do something about my life. A Christian who, uh, is someone who has made the wonderful discovery that God has done something amazing in his life. Uh, Alistair Begg. You know, this, talk about the new year, wanting to be a new you and doing new things. Is A lot of times we take that as, as Christianity, that, man, I just need to start doing something better. I need to better myself. I need some self-care. Well, no, you need to just spend time with the Lord. And I know maybe you've adopted that saying, as <laughs> spending time with the Lord, but sincerely, there's nothing we can do to care for ourselves other than fall at the feet of Jesus. And from there, he will begin to live a new life through us, one that wasn't possible. You know, I was thinking last night, uh, just in the kitchen and getting something and thinking, man, uh, I was unable to do anything in my life before the Lord. I had reached a point of insanity in my life, and I couldn't even hold down a relationship or a conversation. And now, look, God's give me a family, a home, I can hold down a job, I can pack up a car and move, all these things, uh, because God has enabled me to. Not because I pulled myself up and got ready to do it and put my mind back together. No, because I fell at the feet of Jesus. But what does the Bible say about New Year's? What was New Year's like in the Bible? Well, uh, the Jewish calendar really has two New Year's. It has the religious and the civil. Uh, the religious is in the month of Nisan, uh, that's March 15th uh, to the 14th of Passover, March 29th, so it's in March. 
And then it also has the civil, the month of Tishri around September 15th, and the Day of Atonement was around then. Uh, so the, the, these two New Years are really tied to Passover and Atonement, to when God passed over their sins, but also to when they need to seek atonement and to seek uh, really at-one-ment with God uh, in uh, March and September, so about six months apart. They couldn't even go a whole year. They had to have two New Year celebrations in the same year. Uh, Passover and Exodus, when God passes over their sins and passes over their doorposts when they put blood on it before they flee Egypt. Um, but it was the Lord's Passover. It was the Lord was the one who was doing the Passover. Uh, the Israelites just had to be ready. They just had to go to bed with their clothes on and their boots on and put some blood on the door and just wait for God to do the work to free them uh, from the slavery that they had been in. Uh, maybe you felt in slavery this past year. So whatever it is, even if it's a good thing, maybe it's just responsibility. Um, but we have to wait and let God free us from it. We can't break the chains. A lot of times people just quit a job or up and quit a relationship or whatever just to try and free themselves. But it doesn't really free them. They really need to be freed by the Lord in those things. They might even find freedom within that same situation. But anything covered by the blood was saved. Uh, and man, I, I need to be covered by the blood. The Day of Atonement, the one day a year the high priest could enter into God's presence and offer a sacrifice for the people for the forgiveness. You know, so when the high priest would go in, he would sprinkle blood on the, uh, on the, uh, blanking out on the altar, on the Ark of the Covenant, and he would offer uh, prayers for, the peop- for, for himself and for the people and the nation. Um, and if it wasn't an acceptable sacrifice, God killed him. You know, he became the acceptable sacrifice, and then they would have to end up pulling him out because no one else could go in there. Um, pretty scary time, but it was also a time that was solemn, a time when people really began to, you know, to, to think on their sin and, and really realize, man, uh, it's more serious than, than I take it to be. Um, in Leviticus 23, God talks about this. says, uh, also on the 10th day of the month, saying, it shall be a day of atonement, it shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and, and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall do no work, it shall be a day of rest. But basically he's saying, it's serious. You need to take it seriously. You need to sit down and like uh, the Bible says to, you know, consider rather go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting. So if it's the end of the year and you're beginning to wonder, man, this past year was awful. Well, really consider why it was awful. Not just that the world had it out against you, but perhaps you did it to yourself. Perhaps there were things in your life that, that God told you to get rid of or stop doing and you refused. And, and it led to some catastrophes this year. Perhaps it's leading to catastrophes next year. But let it be uh, a time to actually take it to the Lord. That he might exchange that mourning uh, for uh, joy, for feasting. But one thing we can rest in if we are afflicted at the end of the year by some weight of some decision or some sin or some event from the past year is Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgression from us that no matter how bad, no matter how awful, God can remove that transgression to where it's as far as the east is the west. It's, it just goes on forever and ever and ever. Um, you think of the, you know, if you're... I'm not much of a math nerd, but for some reason I'm thinking of the number line. You know, it goes from zero to infinity one direction, zero to negative infinity, uh, even though it's technically incorrect. Uh, the other direction, the, they don't meet. The line just goes on forever and ever, and it will never meet. And uh, God, that's how far God takes our sin away from us. And we never have to remember it. We never have to, you know, uh, dig it up in the backyard and find it one day, an accident when we're planting flowers, is that God takes our sin away. Um, and that's his desire. It's not something that he has to do. It's something that he wanted to do. It's something that he sent his son to die for, uh, to take our sins away, all of our failures, all of our shortcomings, all of our screw-ups, and not just to take them away, but to plant something new in its place, a new life, his resurrected life there. Because he desires also to protect us from judgment and the painful end that sin brings. God does not want you to have to go to court and have to go to jail, spiritually, so to speak, if you don't want to. He'll let you go there if that's where you want to go, but he's going to do everything possible to get your attention. And maybe the heartache at the end of the year is that is one of his ways of getting your attention that you might turn to him and seek him. And he made sure that the Israelites remember this every new year. 
remembered it civilly, remembered it spiritually, that they couldn't escape it, that they remembered it every six months that they needed him to be their new life. Let's read Romans uh, 8, 28 through 39. Um, you probably know this area of scripture. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who, are, who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate you. Nothing you've done this past year, or has happened, or will happen this next year in your life, can separate you from the love of God. In a way, though, if you want it to, it can. If you want it to let it blind you, if you want it to let it distract you from God's love or close you off to it, it can. But you know what? God always makes a way back. It was so important to him, like I said, he had two celebrations throughout the year to remind his people that there was a way back to him. If they felt, uh, we go a year, but man, God's saying, I don't even want you to go six months without realizing that you can turn around, you can get back on track with me. And I think God doesn't even want us to go a day like that. You know, Christmas and Easter is Jesus' birth to, of God to be with us. So we learned recently, Emmanuel, God with us. Easter was Jesus' death and life so we can be with him. May knew God came to be with us that we might be with him. God does not forget that. You know, Christmas and Easter, we may forget about it. It may come, you know, once a year each. But God is that way every day with us. That he wants, us, he wants to come be with us that we might be with him. I don't know what your, the past year uh, for you has been like. I know what it's been like for you, babe. Uh, but part of it was a blur. You know, we had at work, we had a department year-end review. Um, uh, not really kind of a performance review, but really um, uh, looking at the things we've done in the past year and, want, and going over projects, things we've done well and could have done better, where we could have done improvements and really kind of, kind of pat, pat each other on the back for doing a good job and really kind of have a nice uh, team building there. Uh, but a lot of things we couldn't even remember before June. We were looking back and trying to remember, what, well, what happened before June? What, oh, that project was this year? It was just a blur. It was so busy. And I think even personally for uh, us, knowing that the ramp up to June, the couple months before June was really, well, we're moving out here. We got to get everything together. We got to get, um, get in the car, get a trailer, find a place to live, pack up all our stuff, say our goodbyes, of course. And it was a blur, and then we got here four days. I don't, <laughs> woo. But we got here, and it was a blur. Um, but since then, I feel like things have slowed down a bit. And I think, uh, you know, even before that, the past seven years of marriage almost, it was a blur. So many things going on and happening. I feel like we're finally starting to get in the stride where things are still moving, and they're moving at a quick pace, but we're able to savor it a little bit more. Um, not so much fast food anymore in life. Uh, but did you accomplish what God wanted, what you wanted to, excuse me, in your life this past year? Were there things that you had set out to do to accomplish? Um, you know, I, I wanted to start running. I haven't started running. <laughs> yeah, and it's too cold now. <laughs> There's always an excuse, right? But did you see all that God wanted done in your life? Were there things that God had, had spoken to you about or led you to? Um, did you see them come to be? Or perhaps you missed the boat on them. Or perhaps they're just not to be yet. Maybe it's a promise like Abraham and Sarah where it's going to take quite a few years for you to see the fruit of them. Would you rather forget the last year 
Would you rather forget the last 10 years? Uh, was it a good year? Was it a bad year? And if it was a good year, do you want next year to be even better? Or are you just happy with just coasting and hoping it stays? I know every time I hope that it coasts and stays, that's when things happen and it doesn't stay the same. But again, Ecclesiastes 7 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof, and the patient in spirit than the proud in spirit. So I think the end of the year is, is better than the beginning of a year. But when things are finished, good or bad, it's always better than the beginning. You know, the beginning can be exciting, it's new, it's fun. Wow, it's 2019, it's January again. But the end is better. Hopefully, you've learned something this past year. Good or bad, even if it's uh, uh, from a mistake, hopefully you learned something from it. Maybe you've gotten to know somebody or gotten through something. Maybe you've gotten stronger in that aspect. But even if it's bad, when it's over, it's over. And now instead of having to go through it, it's time to get better. It's time to recover. Uh, think about having like the flu or something. Man, the, better of, the end of the flu is much better than the beginning of it. But Christian, don't be tempted to look back. Or when you are tempted to look back, know that it's not better. That there's a reason why you left that situation or that relationship, or perhaps why that relationship or that situation left you. Um, but, and that's where the Lord found you. There's a reason you came to know the Lord. It's because you realize things need to be a lot better in my life. And, and this is the real way to get better. Um, Ecclesiastes 7.10 again says, Do not say, why are the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Ah, 1999 was so much better than 2018. Well, was it? I don't think so. Uh, so why we left it behind. If it, was, if it was better than now, then we, we would never have sought out the new inventions that we've had. You know, it's not wise. And if you think that the former days are better than these... You'll never figure out why. You may have rose-colored glasses, like I said. You look back and go, ah, oh, that relationship or that time in my life was so much better. But then you consider the big picture and you go, no, it wasn't. Nothing was ever going good. Nothing was ever going right. This was always wrong or I was unhappy or et cetera. And you go, no, you know what? It really wasn't better. And the problem with that is, is when we begin to look back and dwell on the past, we end up missing on the things in life that are now. We end up missing out on the promises of God for our life even now. And as the year begins to start, how do you want your new year to be? How do you want it to be? Well, I want it to be restful. I want to go to Walmart, no traffic on the road, no one in the store, get the trip done and come back and not have any problem on New Year's Day. I'm hoping that if I go early in the morning. But sincerely... How do we want the new year to be? Even if it was good, do you want it to be better? And how is it going to be better? Well, number one, it's going to be better by asking God what his plans for the year are, rather than figuring out what our own plans are. Say, God, what is your plan for this new year? I have all these plans. I have all these purposes that I'd like to do in this new year. I'd like to do this and that and go here and here and do this and that. Take vacation then, do this, go there. But really, what does God have for for us the new year. Maybe it is some of those things, but maybe it's none of those things. And if we're going to be striving against God's plan for our life, our new year is not going to be very good. But if we let him dictate it and lay it out and really plan it for us, it's much better. Because I guarantee that they're better than anything you've imagined. Deuteronomy 31, 6, God says this, be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them for the Lord your God. He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. And this next year, God is the one who goes with you. And he's not going to leave you forsaken this year. Maybe you've got some big things that are coming on the horizon. Know that God will not leave you in them. Although others might. Joshua 1.5 No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. That as you go, and you, maybe you've gotten a position of leadership or taking on a new role at work or whatever it is in life, know that whoever's going to come against you, that, that God's there with you, that God has gone with believers before you, and he's going to go with you even now. 
Hebrews 13, 5 through 6 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. You know, maybe you didn't get everything you wanted for Christmas, but be content with that. Don't spend this next year striving for better Christmas gifts next year. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, this is why, because he never leaves us or forsakes us, we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The world is upset over what other people say, what other people do, whether it has any bearing or reality or not. People are afraid. But there's one way to not be afraid this next year is to know that God is not going to leave you or forsake you. And that gives us boldness and that gives us confidence. What can man do to me? Sure, man can beat you up, hurt you. The government can come steal your money. But you know what? The Lord is your helper. What can man do to me? At the end of the day, they can't do anything to you. They can take away your earthly things, but they can't take away your heavenly things. So don't give away your heavenly things. But I love that it says, so we may boldly say, we may boldly say, and that's important. Can we boldly say that Jesus is our helper? As believers, can we boldly say, yeah, you know what? God is my helper. Yeah, I was upset over this thing and I was bothered by it, but I took it to the Lord and I knew, well, it still bothers me. It still hurts. I still don't like it, but I can boldly say that God is going to help me through it. Because we don't need the things of this life to make us happy. Because that's what happiness is. Happy New Year. It's the new year. Your situation is new. The year is new. But then that situation, all of a sudden it's June, all of a sudden it's September, and that new year is now the old year, and your situation has changed. So you're now unhappy because your happiness is based on fleeting things. Let God be your helper this year. You know, God has met our needs so many times in this past year. Um, even just getting here physically, God met our needs to get us here. Um, But with this new year, has God given you any word yet? <laughs> Don't fret. There's still a couple days left. Is there a Bible verse just for you? Have you been spending the time with the necessary to hear what he might say to you this year? Ask him. Ask him about the things coming up. Maybe, you know, like we know we have a baby coming. We're asking God, what should we name the baby? <laughs> what should we name them? But it doesn't have to be just on January 1. You don't have to wait the extra 36 hours, or whatever it is from right now. Um, Lamentations 3, 22 through 23 says, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. Though the Lord's mercies were not consumed, we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That God's mercies are new every morning. We don't have to wait for the Day of Atonement anymore. We don't have to, even then, this is an Old Testament verse, we don't have to wait uh, for New Year's Day we can just wait for the morning. And really, we don't even have to wait for the morning. We can get up at 2 in the morning. We can do it right before we go to bed. That his mercy will be new there. It's, you know, they say it's 5 o'clock somewhere. Well, it's morning somewhere, always with the Lord. That he can always rise on you and give light and warmth to you when you need it. Because of that, there is hope for your new year. Because there is mercy available every single day. Of the new year even on leap year when there's an extra day there's still mercy available so spend that time in the morning whatever it is spend that time as soon as you wake up if you can with the lord do you want a new year well you don't need a new hue so to speak you need to let god renew it like we read earlier second corinthians 5 17 therefore if any man is in christ he is a new creature Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That man, we need to let God, let the old things die in our life to put off the old man and put on the new man in Christ. And that new man is Christ. Uh, Joel 2.25-29 says, So I will restore to you the years that are the swarming locusts have eaten, the crawling locusts, the consuming locusts, and the chewing locusts, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also my men servants and all my men servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. I love that this two famous passages of uh, Scripture are together. 
that God says, man, I've allowed these hard things to come in your life. The locusts, perhaps it's because of your sin, have come and stripped out all the good things of your life. You're barren, you're empty, you're hungry, you're wanting, but I've allowed that for good. You turn to me and I'm going to fill you up. You turn to me, it's going to be like they never came in and swarmed. It's going to be like that one year of crops you lost, I'm going to give you seven years of good crops that totally erase anything that the enemy has taken from you. So know that this past year has been bad, that God has allowed it for a reason, that you might come to him and turn to him, that the next year and the rest of your life really would be wonderful in him. Perhaps you'll never be rich. Perhaps you'll never uh, make it to that big party where the ball drops. But God wants to fill your life. And more than if he's allowed a physical draining in your life, he allows those physical drainings that the spirit might be full because he goes on to say that he's going to pour out his spirit. That, yeah, you haven't had much rain in your life physically. It's been a dry year physically, but God's going to give you a full year spiritually. He wants to pour it out on you, on your descendants, on your friends and your family because it's the last days. It's the last days. God wants to bless his last days. As bad as 2018 was, 2017, 2016, I can't imagine getting much better in my mind than 2001. But God wants to pour out his spirit. In his last days, he wants to fill you and enable you to see him and see heaven and be a part of a heavenly kingdom that will not end, that has no new year because it is eternal. But are you still doing the same things you wish you didn't or you wish you wouldn't? Are there things in your life that you do that, man, this, I know this needs to stop. I just I can't. I don't know how. I'm not sure if I can. Well, continue in the things of God. If you're a believer, keep seeking Him. Keep asking. Keep knocking. If you're not a believer, turn to Him. Try God. <laughs> Let Him see. Let Him show you. Taste and see that He is good and that He's able to remove these things. Uh, I used to smoke like crazy before I got saved. I get saved. I want to quit. I think I need the patch. I try using the patch and God speaks to me in the way and says, you don't need that to stop. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I can do that. And I tried it and you know what? It worked. It was, it was still hard. It was still a struggle. But it worked. But do you want to continue in the things of God? Well, it doesn't take a New Year's resolution. It doesn't take a resolution. It takes a Repentance. It doesn't take punishment. It takes forgiveness. And it doesn't take hard work. It takes being submitted to the Holy Spirit. And that can be hard. But it doesn't take you doing it on your own strength. It takes you letting Him be your strength. It takes Jesus lifting you up. He says that all those who are bowed down, who are humble themselves, He will lift up in due time. If you need a new year, a new you, well, get down first and let him lift you up. This is from uh, Power of His Presence, January 1. I read this a couple years ago. It says, Repentance is the way people come to God, and the result is the forgiveness of sins. No, Lord, no one else is to blame, only I. This is the way I am, and I need help. This is where God will meet you. If you realize you need help, don't turn to yourself for help. You can't help yourself. You can, the only help you're going to get yourself is into more trouble. There's times when I try and help myself. When uh, I was working on the car a couple weeks ago and I was trying to get a seal in and it wasn't going in and I didn't have the right tool, I tried to help myself and just bang it in there. Well, I'm just going to manhandle this in there and use my own strength to do it. And it boogered it up and I went to every part store in the town and nobody had it, and no one locally had it. I had to buy it online, so I had to let the car sit there and wait to get it, and then I had to go get the tool and do it. And even then, it was still hard. I was still praying, God, help me on this. But sincerely, in our lives, we're just going to booger things up if we try and hammer it home ourselves, if we try and force it this next year to happen and make this next year better, something's going to hurt. It's going to be a relationship. It's going to be a thing. It's going to be ourselves. Um, I remember working out with a friend a couple years ago, you know, I wanted to get back into uh, working out, and I started worked out with him one day, but he went nuts, and I couldn't bend my arms. I had, like my arms were so hurt. So that's my excuse for not working out since then. But sincerely, man, we can't overdo it. Can't overdo it. You have to let God do it. And the way we do that is by repenting, to turn from the things that hold you down, 
and turn to the one who can lift you up, who will lift you up. All these things in life promise to lift ourselves up, but they won't. I'm going to read the lyrics of this song. I'm not going to sing them to you, but it says, Where hope can hold the hand of sorrow, and we can walk into tomorrow, where peace is found in the troubled days, and the joy of Jesus carries pain away. This is a new year. This is a new day to rise, shine, and lift your eyes. This is a new year. This is a new day to rise, shine, and point the way to God's great life. It's a Charlie Hall song. That we need to point. We need to lift our eyes to God. That This is a new year. This is a new day when I can turn to Jesus. That God has given us a new year and a new day in Him. Because better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. Because believer, if you're a believer, remember that you're already new. Peter said, Jesus, wash me all over then. Jesus, Peter, you're fine. Let me just wash your feet. You know, you're already clean by the words that I've spoken to you. You're already new. It's not what, you, what you're going to do tomorrow or Tuesday on New Year's Day. But it's what Jesus did two millennia ago. That God did it already. Let him do it this year. Let that be enough this year. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So with that, happy renew year. You don't need a new year. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind in Jesus Christ. God, thank you for this. Thank you for your word and your truth. Thank you that you did die on the cross for us, that you don't expect us to do it on our own or ourselves. You don't ask us to. You just say, come to me, all you are heavy laden and, and burdened and weak and weary, and, uh, and come to me, and I will give you rest for your souls. Take my yoke upon you, for I am lowly and gentle of heart. That God, you are gentle. That God, when we come to you, you will not beat us up. A, a bruised reed, a smoking flax, you will not um, quench or put out or break even further. But God, more broken, and we come to you. You bind us up. You lift us up with your new mercies every morning. God. So we ask for that for our friends, for our family, for this town. God, that your mercies would be new every morning, that there would be a new year uh, in all our lives because of what you did for us, Jesus. And we ask that you would come soon and we could say goodbye to New Year's forever and just live in eternity with you. We look forward to that, that ball dropping, God. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.